Hello students, my name is Nancy LaPlaca and I'm doing a guest lecture for Elise McLaughlin on energy. And energy I think is particularly important and especially considering what we've all been through the last month or two or three with the coronavirus, a pandemic hitting our world and our country and our state and our university. The issue of energy is particularly important because right behind food and water, in terms of our needs, is energy. And we are basically energy blind as a society. We don't really see it. And this market crash as a result of this world pandemic is really roiling the world of fossil fuels. And we're gonna go through some of those, uh, some of those issues. To give you a little background on me, um, my name again is Nancy LaPlaca, and I'm adjunct faculty sometimes in sustainable development. I'll be teaching a class in the fall of 2020 on energy policy, electricity issues, clean energy, obstacles and opportunities in clean energy. Um, I've been working to promote clean energy for 15 years now. I started in 2006 fighting clean coal, which is totally false and doesn't really exist. And since then, I have worked as a uh, consultant, policy advisor, and worked for different advocacy and environmental groups on energy policy. And basically what I want to talk to about you about today is that the fossil fuel world that has run our world for the last hundred years or more is changing and it's changing rapidly. And not just for climate change, but for many, many different reasons we need to change from fossil fuels to clean energy. So I'm gonna start here with my slides. And uh, let's start with the first one here. Let's see, play from the start. And I'm gonna go pretty fast here, folks. And so if you have any questions or you would like to talk to me further, please find me. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody about clean energy, clean energy jobs, internships, what's going on, what kind of markets do I think are going to thrive in the future. Um, I'm also a town council person and working on getting more clean energy in Boone and at App State. So to start out with this uh, first slide, basically what I talk about in my class is if clean energy is so cheap, why don't we have more? And the short answer is because it's politics. It's not because of technology, and it's not because of cost. It's basically because of established systems and corporations that don't want to change. Um, one of the things that's really interesting in dealing with the younger generation with, that I really, really enjoy is that equity is such an important issue as it should be. And when you consider that we have seven and a half billion people in this world, and those of us in the developed world can get all the energy we want, really, pretty cheap, there are a couple billion people in this world who, who don't have it, who can't get energy, and there's not much available. There's not electricity available. There's not electricity to pump water, et cetera. So this is a slide I made a long time ago. And when I made this slide, the cost of renewable energy was way higher than it is right now, over 10 times. And I made this slide, I think, around 2007. So the cost of clean energy has literally come down between 90 and 95 percent since 2007. Um, and what I want you to understand about this slide is that there's this concept called net energy. And net energy is the energy that's left over after you spend energy to get the, the fossil fuel or whatever kind of energy it is, build the solar panel, build the wind turbine, frack the ground to pull out the shale gas. And um, net energy's really changed over the decades so that 
so much so that 100 years ago, 150 years ago, if you took a pipe in a, in a place, oil rich place like Texas, and you put it in the ground in a place where there was a lot of oil, the oil would literally shoot out of the ground. And so every unit of energy that you would spend to get the oil, in other words, putting the pipe in the ground, would give you back a hundred units of energy. Now, can you imagine if you invested a dollar and you got back a hundred dollars? That is basically what happened. And what's been happening in our society is that as we use dirtier and dirtier energy, that net energy is getting to be less and less and less. And so the difference between a hundred years ago or so when we put the first pipe you know, when we started discovering oil in places like California and Texas and Pennsylvania. Um, now we're going out on big, giant platforms in the middle of the ocean. And those platforms cost billions of dollars each, three, four, five billion dollars. And we're going down, you know, 5,000 feet to the ocean floor and then another 5,000 feet down. So basically we're expending more and more energy to get energy. And of course, that has environmental costs. And when I was young, everyone ignored it. And frankly, it's only fairly recently that as a society, we've recognized that pollution has a real cost. And as we'll go through in these slides, it has a huge cost. So net energy is declining. And so this is another reason why we need to change. And, and I'll show you some of this decline in future slides here. So, the difference, the basic difference between renewable energy and fossil fuels is that renewable energy, while it produces much less energy, it doesn't have, it doesn't require fuel, it doesn't require transportation of fuels, it doesn't require pipelines, railroads, it doesn't have coal ash, coal waste, nuclear waste, fracking gas, uh, contaminated water, etc. Now, it's not that it's 100% pollution free, but uh, the pollution that's generated for every megawatt hour of power is far, far less. So, and then of course there's environmental justice issues which are huge. Okay, so in talking about net energy, I wanna talk about how dense oil is. Oil is so energy dense, it's unbelievable. One gallon of gasoline equals 450 hours of human labor. That is unbelievable. Literally, if you are going to pay someone for the same energy that is in a barrel of oil, you would, at, at the old prices, the price is down by almost half now, you would pay a quarter to a half a million dollars for one barrel of oil. That is how energy dense oil is. It's unbelievable. Think of it, a little bit of oil will drive a giant SUV uphill. Can you imagine if you had to push that SUV uphill? So I wanna show you some slides to show you how energy dense our use is. You know, the darker the color, the more energy consumption. So we use a lot of energy. Russia uses a lot of energy. China uses a lot of energy. Although we use much more energy per person than someplace like China. And then something that kind of surprises people, it surprised me, is look how much oil we get from Canada. We get quite a lot of our oil from Canada, 43%. These numbers are all really in flux right now because the oil markets are roiling and because there's there's uh, a lot of political unrest in places like Venezuela. Uh, you've got OPEC at war with, uh, you know, you've got Russia and OPEC undercutting each other, underbidding each other. So this is in flux, but basically we get a lot of oil from Canada and unfortunately it's mostly from tar sands, which is very dirty. And if you remember only one thing from this lecture, I would like you to remember these next couple slides. And, he, and here's why. Look at the dates on these slides. This is 1940, goes up every 10 years, you can see, all the way up to about 2020. And uh, 2015, rather, I'm sorry, 2015. 
a little bit less, a little bit after that, 2017. So in 1940, the United States started producing crude oil, and we were indeed one of the world's biggest crude oil producers, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, huge world oil producers. So we peaked the United States, this is US, in conventional oil production in 1970. And back in 1956, a pretty famous guy in the world of oil named Dr. M. King Hubbard predicted this. And in fact, I think it was 1956, he was working for Shell Oil Company and he did a presentation and he told the Shell Oil people, I am going to tell my audience that I think that U.S. oil production is going to peak in the 1970s, early 1970s. And the oil company told him, please don't tell everybody that. And he said, no, I need to tell them that. People need to know this. And he did. And, and he's, he's very famous because he was right. He actually died before he was proven right. But he was right. U.S. Uh, conventional oil production peaked in around 1973, 1972, 1973. And ever since that time, it went, as you can see here, down, 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 down. This dip here was after the uh, oil embargo of 73, when the U.S. rapidly reduced its, its oil use. That's when Jimmy Carter asked everybody to wear a sweater. I remember that well. And then, uh, and then SUVs started getting popular and energy use started rising again. But basically, it went down. And the lowest point was here around 2000, actually, 2007, eight, something like that. And then notice how, how quickly this ramped up here between, let's say 2006 and 2012, 2017. And that is because of fracking. There is fracking. The oil that was produced between 1940 and 2006 was not fracked. Fracking is a new phenomenon, and this steep, steep, steep curve is all fracking. And uh, anyway, the reason why this is so important is because what goes up must come down. And because the nature of fracking, the wells are depleted so quickly that this steep, steep curve up, many, many experts are predicting it will be a very steep curve down very steep. So let's go on. And I want to show you that not just natural gas, but also oil are, is fracked. And so basically fracking accounts for 50% of U.S. oil. And so when we look at this, this, this huge rise right here, that is this light blue color, fracking. It's fracked oil. So that instead of drilling straight down, that's what a conventional oil well is, you drill straight down. A fracked well, it actually is very high technology. It, it goes down and then it takes a right turn under the ground. And it goes out hundreds and hundreds of feet, many hundreds of feet. And then out of that line, uh, laterals split rock. They frack the rock. In other words, they fracture the rock. That's where the word comes from. And so out of that rock, little tiny, tiny molecules of gas are collected, and then they go up the well casing. So fracking is far different than conventional drilling. And now I wanna show you how this came down by state, because this really shows you what happened. Let's take Texas, here's Texas. Look at Texas, even back in 1970, biggest oil producer in the country by far. Look, Alaska, for a while, oop, there's the North Slope. Alaska jumped up, but then the North Slope went down, 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 down. So here's Texas, the, the giant, 1970. Whoops. It goes down, 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 down. This is all conventional drilling, just a hole straight down to a, a, a a pool of oil or a pool of gas and sucks it up like through a straw. And then look what happened in fracking in Texas around 2006. Boom, it goes up. 
So this is something else really interesting in the oil industry is that revenues are way, way, way down. Profits are way down. And since this slide was made, it, there's been a bloodbath since then. So as far as I'm concerned, I am an unabashed clean energy advocate, and I think we need to rapidly reduce fossil fuel use, just like the IPCC is telling us. And so this is really, to be honest for me, this is great news because the oil industry is not as rich as it used to be. They used to be a significant part of, this, of the, uh, the S&P index, the stock market, and they are no longer because the dollar amounts, look, between 2011 and 2015, total revenues down by over half. And even more importantly, they're losing money. So this brown line is expenditures. This blue line is cash for operations. What happens when you spend more than you take in? You lose money. Whoops, and so here's just another one that basically says the same thing. Get rid of this as much as I can. Let's see. Oops. Anyway, you can see that they're losing money, and that's what this next one says too. Just put that right there. So debt to equity ratio, losing money, basically. And then I just copied this. This was just put out in March of 2020. This is an excellent group called the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. And basically, just in one year, the oil and gas companies that are uh, focused on fracking lost over $2 billion. That's in one year. And over a decade, they lost almost $200 billion. $189 billion. So we are talking a significant, significant dollars here. And what's the problem with these companies? Well, they've got high debt and it's only going up. Total long-term debt is rising. If they can't produce cash flows over the next years, they can't pay their debts. So if you're a debt, and you lose your income or your income goes down by half, you're even in even more trouble, as I'm sorry to say young people know all too well in our Ponzi scheme economy. So um, basically they have significant net losses and declining cash balances. This is another couple of articles that say that the shale gas industry has lost $280 billion since 2007. So that's 13 years ago, $280 billion. And here's the links. And Art Berman is a long time, very highly respected geologist. And basically what he says is, without cheap credit, we would never have had the shale boom. And Art says the reason is because the cost to produce shale, gas, or oil is higher than the commodity. In other words, it costs me four dollars a million BTU to produce that gas, but I'm only selling it for three dollars a million BTU. So I'm losing a dollar every time I sell it. And you know, people, you know, smart people would ask, well, how come this Ponzi scheme continues and the Wall Street fees are huge? And these guys get paid whether they the, the shale guys make money or not. A lot of people have compared this to the housing bubble, and that's very apt as far as I'm concerned. I put a bunch of headlines here of some really interesting stories. This woman, her name's Bethany McLean, and you guys are probably too young to remember the Enron crisis, but Enron was basically an oil services company that was a Ponzi scheme. It was a total Ponzi scheme. At one point, it was one of the highest value companies in the, in the country, in the United States. And it was built on nothing. And this woman, Bethany McLean, basically was the first person to dig up this story, or one of the first. And she wrote a new book, and her book is about fracking. And it basically is that fracking is another Ponzi scheme. And this says it all, fueled by debt and years of easy credit, America's energy boom is on shaky footing. And this is in 2018, she wrote, wrote this. 
So this story has been out for quite a while. And then this is from Bloomberg. This is, look, March 9th, 2020. Shale's new reality, almost all wells drilled now lose money. And then I took this from that article um, <clears throat> that look how, look how unprofitable they are. So this is the price that you would need for a 10% profit. And this is the price you would need for a 30% profit. And look at what oils cost right now today. Today, it's like, you know, less than $30 a barrel. So basically, across these giant plays, these are areas of the country. The Permian's in Texas. The Bakken is in North Dakota. The Eagle Ford is in Texas. Uh, they're unprofitable. And then just to show you how crazy this is, um, here is the price of oil since 1983. There's the point where it went up to $147 a barrel. And then it stayed around $100 a barrel for a few years. <coughs> Excuse me. It was getting back to 50 where producers could, some producers could make money, and now it's back down. So let's move on to electricity. And electricity is one of the reasons why electricity is, our ho is a hope for clean energy in the future is because we can, there are substitutes for, for electricity. Um, the substitutes for coal, natural gas, and nuclear are wind and solar, uh, geothermal, and there are other technologies like energy efficiency, et cetera. But basically, if we could take our cars and run them on electricity, we would have a much more efficient economy. And the reason is because cars lose 80% of their energy in heat and pollution. Let me say that again, because it's kind of unbelievable. A, an internal combustion engine vehicle running on gasoline or diesel, just an internal combustion engine, loses 80% of its energy as heat and pollution. So when you go to an electric car that's flipped, it's 80% efficient. So you only lose 20%. So then if you get that electricity from solar and wind and clean energy sources, and you get your electricity from solar and wind and clean energy sources, you really can affect not just your greenhouse gas footprint, but your total pollution footprint. So I just wanted to show you that, you know, this country is still 30% coal, 30% natural gas, about 20% nuclear. Solar is up, since I made this slide, it's about two and a half percent. Wind is about seven. And this repeats what I said just a minute ago, that basically for many of these processes where you have an internal combustion engine, you have a conversion of energy, your losses in thermal production, see this red, that is, those are losses. This is the primary energy input. In other words, Let's think of all of this as, well, there's coal, oil, gas, et cetera. So all of this gets put in. And really, because the conversion losses are so giant, only a third of that energy in an electric power plant is actually turned into work. So all that pollution, all that water used, all that heat is for nothing. So a coal plant, uh, an, an oil plant, a natural gas plant, they lose two thirds of their energy as heat and pollution. I also wanted to show you how much money states spend on, on uh, fossil fuels. It's staggering. Let's, just, let's take Florida here, $8 billion. Florida is like less than 2% solar right now, less than 2%. And yet they're spending $8 billion a year importing coal and natural gas. In fact, the coal comes from a barge in South America. Why? Because it's cheaper to float the coal from South America 
than it is to put the coal on a train and ship it here, ship it to Florida. So it's just sad. And in Florida, in fact, they're building all these pipelines. They're going to bring in fracked gas, either from the north of us in Pennsylvania, or they're going to try to bring it from Texas. So you, you see this unbelievable bias, even in the sunniest places in this country, Arizona, Florida, Utah, New Mexico, a bias against clean energy that's just staggering. And then when you look and you see how much money we spend buying fossil fuels, North Carolina, you know, three billion a year importing coal and natural gas. That's crazy. And I, I wanted to show you that, yes, coal is down, coal is down, coal is down, coal is down in all these parts of the country, but gas is up, unfortunately. And then here's North Carolina. So this is 2004, this is 2014. In 2004, we were 61% coal. And by 2014, that was down to 39. Now it's down to like 25 to 30, depending. But natural gas was only 2% in 2004. In 2014, it was 23%. And now it's like 30 to 34%. So coal down, gas up. So what does electricity cost? Why do we have all these fights about it, for heaven's sake? Can't you just tell me this is what it costs? And it's complicated. It, it's, it takes a lot of work to understand the electricity system because it is complicated and it's not something that people have thought about for a while. In fact, what I found in my experience is that people from other countries, especially from the continent of Africa, because there is so little electricity in the whole country. They get it, they understand it, they know where every power plant is, they know what's going on. They're also highly exploited. The, the, the continent of Africa for its oil and gas, quite highly exploited. So this is just a couple of things. These are the kinds of things that we get into in my class if you're interested in knowing what does it cost and how do we figure it out. And many costs are not counted. Pollution isn't counted. Waste isn't counted. Uh, waste removal, labor, uh, carbon. Uh, we don't count the value of solar, that solar doesn't generate any pollution and that there's no fuel risk and that it delivers electricity when we need it the most, many times, at least in the hot summers. So, what about subsidies? There's this big meme out there that renewables are getting lots of subsidies, and that is simply not true. And really, this was done by a woman uh, named Nancy Fund, who I worked with years ago. And she is a hedge fund gal who got into clean energy in a big way. And she put together this wonderful report called What Would Jefferson Do? And basically, it analyzed uh, subsidies for energy over a uh, hundred years. And basically what she found is that this is oil and gas. Oil and gas got the vast majority because why? Well, we started giving oil and gas subsidies in 1918. So, this, so they get the lion's share of the pie. And then the other uh, big giant subsidy is nuclear. Nuclear got huge subsidies between 1947 and 1999, especially uh, early on in the, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And look at renewables, a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of the total spent on subsidies. So here is annual energy subsidies. And again, even when you, when you uh, split it up annually, renewables gets by far, let me move this, the least amount. So what about wind? You know, wind is such a really interesting, wonderful uh, resource. And wind is actually, I need to update this, Iowa right now gets 40% of its electricity from wind, 40%. That is 40% of the electricity that runs through everyone's wires and delivers electricity to everybody, whether you're a business, a commercial, 
in, you know, industrial, a factory, 40% comes from wind turbines. That's unbelievable. Also huge amounts of wind electricity in Kansas, Oklahoma, South Dakota, et cetera. Um, and the nice thing is that the wind turbines are becoming more efficient. Uh, they, the whole meme of killing birds is quite overblown. Wind turbines are larger and they spin slower and the slower spinning does not harm birds. And also the design of the wind turbines, they're now designed so that to discourage any kind of birds from coming close to them. And wind is really, really cheap. It's really cheap. Two cents a kilowatt hour. So to put that in perspective, the power bill that you pay when you pay your electricity bill is about, you probably pay about nine cents a kilowatt hour. Wind is coming in at two cents a kilowatt hour. So wind saves fuel. You guys might or might remember in 2014, there was a giant polar vortex up in the Northeast. And the, they, when the, over a couple of days, three days, wind saved over a billion dollars. It's the green. And the reason it saved so much money is because they didn't have to buy fuel for power plants. So basically they saved on buying natural gas. And so what we're going to find is that as we move from fossil fuels to renewables, it isn't going to be close to, when they say it's going to cost more, no, it's, it's not. Most people say it's going to cost about the same. You're going to put money into the new renewable infrastructure, but you're going to save so much money on fuel, not buying fuel. You won't have to buy natural gas. You won't have to buy coal. You won't have to buy oil that it's going to actually be cheaper. And then when you start counting the staggering, unbelievable costs and damages to our health and the environment, there's no, there's no contest at all. Fossil fuels are many, 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 many times more expensive, like 10 times. Okay, so I'm gonna go in some depth here in fracking. And because natural gas is gonna be a big part of our future and it's gonna be a big part of your future as young people. And here is the cost of natural gas. So, you know, I remember in the 80s and the 90s, you didn't even really hear about natural gas. It just, it cost $2 a million BTU, it, which, which think of it as a gallon, two bucks. It cost two bucks, it cost two bucks. Then starting around 2000, the price started getting very volatile. And this is Hurricane Katrina. And basically, as every time we have some kind of a weather, you know, a giant storm or hurricane, <clears throat> natural gas costs can go up. Now, they've gone way down lately because we have too much produced, but it's very volatile. And the thing to remember about natural gas costs and utilities is that fuel is paid by ratepayers, us, the customers, not the utilities. So they don't have any risk if the cost for fuel goes up rapidly, natural gas. They don't pay, that's just a pass-through cost. And just like fracked, like oil, look how much this light brown versus the dark brown, this is how much of our natural gas comes from fracking. Look how quickly this this went up, unbelievable. So that literally in 2000, in the year 2000, only a small percentage, 7% of our natural gas came from fracked and now it's 67%. This is huge. And the reason it's so huge is because these fracked wells decline so rapidly. And that's what this slide is about. This slide tells you that a fracked well declines, the average three-year decline, 70 to 90%. That means you have to keep drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling. And that is quite alarming. So Dr. Howarth is an expert from Cornell and one of the first people to raise the alarm on fracked gas. And basically his studies have been repeated in, in many times. Uh, I mean, his work has been analyzed. He doesn't do the studies. He looks at studies that were done 
and then analyzes that data. And um, one sec. Anyway, and he analyzes this data. And the bottom line is that when Dr. Howarth raised the alarm and said, look, shale gas, which is fracked gas, is worse for the climate than coal. Here's coal. This is the effect of, this is carbon dioxide equivalents. You could see here, look, it's twice as bad as coal. He was a voice in the wilderness, but since then, many, 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 many studies have confirmed what he says, what he has said. And he has been a witness of mine also. And because fracked gas is two thirds of our supply, we're basically, by replacing coal fired electricity with gas fired electricity, when most of it is from fracking, we are really damaging the climate even more. Okay, and I, I talked about these externalized costs and um, these externalized costs are really important because they're giant, they're huge, they're unbelievable. So let's just take a look at coal. It costs three to five cents on average, sometimes even six or seven, because it's getting much more expensive to, to uh, um, to generate coal-fired electricity now. So it costs, let's just say five cents on average to generate a coal-fired electricity kilowatt hour. But the damages from that kilowatt hour are 17.8 to 27 cents. So do the math. Basically we're doing three and a half to six times more uh, damage damage from the coal than the value of the coal-fired electricity itself. So the first rule of holes is quit digging. So it's really crazy, honestly, that we basically spend $40 billion a year, this country, raw on raw coal costs. In other words, every utility across this country, if you added up how much money they're spending purchasing coal to make electricity, it'd be 30 to $40 billion. It's doing, look at this number, $500 billion worth of damage a year. It's unbelievable. And unfortunately, the regulators go like this and the utilities go like this. And so it's, only, it's going to take all of us to wake these people up. And this is basically the work I've been doing for the last 15 years. So another reason why utilities are pushing natural gas, which is very upsetting, is because they make more money when they build pipelines. So Duke Energy, which is one of the biggest utilities in the country and the world, biggest polluter in the country, uh, they are trying to build something called the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. And why do they want to get into the pipeline business? Well, they make a lot more money. So they make 14% profit rather than a power plant, which is eight to 10. The other thing is that the pipeline cost is many, 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 many times higher than the power plant. So a power plant will cost 500 million to a billion, but a pipeline, that pipeline is up to 7.7 .7 billion. So what do they wanna make, eight to 10% on a half a billion or a billion? Or do they wanna make 14% on seven billion? In fact, what's really sad is in 2005, we changed the antitrust laws that would have prevented this type of monopoly. We, we changed those, really sad. Anyway, so is fracked gas a Ponzi scheme? And I would say yes. In my opinion, yes. And we are headed right now into a really interesting kind of crazy time because the cost of oil and natural gas and gas is down so low that I just wonder what is going to happen to these companies. How can they keep producing at a loss? Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip this page, except to mention that the reserves are overestimated. And this is what 
uh, one of my witnesses has been saying for years. And the reason that they overestimate the reserves is to keep their stock price high. Because if the stock market can see that you're going to be running out of something, they are probably not going to buy it. And so basically, the reserves are overestimated. And the Securities and Exchange Commission does not require them to get third party verification. In other words, you guys are telling us this, it's in your interest, but let's have a third party come in like an accounting firm and verify it. And they said, oh no, you don't have to do that. So something that I, I mentioned and uh, I wanna tell you this, this, the IPCC's assessment and what the IPCC says is that natural gas is 86 times worse than CO2 for the climate. And so when you do the math and you take that natural gas because the natural gas power plant is more efficient, you basically end up with the number that a natural gas power plant emits twice as much CO2 equivalent as a coal plant. Okay, and on top of that, these pipes leak and they burst and they explode and you've got all kinds of terrible things that happen. And when they leak, they're even worse for the climate. And utilities are pouring billions and billions into pipelines, but they have little incentive to invest in clean energy. And <clears throat> it's crowding out uh, solar and wind. And I'm going to skip ahead here to clean energy, and we're going to end on clean energy. And clean energy, this is the work that I've been doing for a while. And, and what's really kind of wild is it's not even dependent sometimes on where the cheap resource is, at least for solar. Wind has been more, that's more true. Iowa has a lot of wind because it's a really windy place. Wind is dirt cheap, and they have a lot of open space. Uh, on the other hand, when you look at solar, Arizona has less solar than North Carolina. I spent years working on solar policy in Arizona and frankly gave up. Um, Arizona, 7% solar and 30 to 40% coal. And the utilities run 50 year old coal plants on groundwater. So it's really crazy. Um, and the problem is that we don't have a system that is sensibly looks at, okay, what's our natural assets? Are we sunny? Are we windy? Do we have good co do good do we have good wind on the coast or on the top of a mountain? Or is our solar good in this part of the state but bad in that part of the state? The policy is is not unfortunately not based on common sense things that you would think. And because we only have 250 regulators, that's you public utility regulators, that's who I used to work for, because we, we only have 250 and the whole system is so manipulated and it's complex that these guys basically get away with this. And um, participation in power plant permits, you know, 15 years ago when I started, there were a handful of us. Now there's many, many more people. But basically these are complex, time-consuming, difficult, uh, head-banging proceedings. And the utilities don't want anyone to participate. And the utilities do their best to keep it a black box. They don't want you to see it. So I wanna point something else out too that really struck me when I started this work, um, that fuel costs are, 20 to 35 percent of your total bill. If you could take your bill and analyze it, they don't make it easy. If you could look at the fuel costs, just the raw fuel, it's a huge part of your bill, 20 to 35 percent. And yet, if we look around the country and we see how much does clean energy cost us on the average customer bill, it's 1.6 uh, 1.6 percent. So 1.6 percent versus 20 to 35 percent. Pretty crazy. Here's the cost of solar. 1977, when the nerds were working on it, in 19, let's see, let's move this. And th this doesn't even go to today, well, 2013. Basically, the cost of solar is just down unbelievably. 
jobs. Here's the other thing, kids, and this is why we need people to advocate solar. Look how many more times jobs, times more jobs that solar produces. So basically 79 times more jobs than coal per megawatt hour produced. And then it, lots of savings, billions of dollars of savings from improved air quality, climate damages, health benefits. I mean, it's just unbelievable. The health benefits and climate benefits, $600 billion, unbelievable. And then I'm gonna, I wanna, wanna end here with uh, North Carolina. We have a lot of nuclear, we have a lot of natural gas and the amount of coal is going down. We really need to scale up solar and we really need to scale up customer sited uh, clean energy. And uh, we need to change our policies to do that. So if you look at Duke Energy here, they're really bad in the country. This is, this is a while ago, but they're bad. <clears throat> right now, their goal is something like, it's, it's up a little bit from this, maybe 6% by 2034. It's just pathetic. And our, our potential is enormous. It's absolutely enormous. So here is our offshore wind potential. So the darker the color, the better the potential for offshore wind. We have huge, huge potential for offshore wind. And we need to get that happening ASAP. One of the reasons why we won't be one of the early adopters is because these states north of us their load, in other words, the people that use the electricity are right there on the coast. Think of New York, Boston, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, uh, Wilmington, Delaware, uh, Washington, DC. Um, <clears throat> you're near the coast. Us, all of our population centers are further inland. And so that means you have to get the electricity to those big cities, get the electricity to Charlotte, to Durham, to Raleigh, to Greensboro. Um, but, but we have enormous, enormous potential. <clears throat> Clean energy is cheaper and far less risky. And basically, we need to push back against utilities because they have a financial interest in promoting natural gas and undermining clean energy, unfortunately. <clears throat> we have one of the best success stories in the country, $12 billion. Actually, since I made this slide, it's up to $14 billion, $14, $15 billion. 88% of that is um, solar. And so don't let anybody tell you that this isn't a worthwhile investment. In North Carolina, taxpayers spent $322 million on tax rebates. But that $322 million was returned in state and local taxes and additional money. So that 322 million in tax rebates turned into 520 million in state and local taxes. And that 322 million in tax rebates resulted in $12 billion in economic activity, 12 billion. So this is a worthwhile investment. So I wanna tell you, thank you so much and please contact me if there's anything I could ever help you with that has to do with clean energy or you know, internships, jobs, et cetera, or anything on the town council, anything you're upset about or you'd like to talk about. Uh, thank you so much.